Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. Do you know the true story behind Thanksgiving? Did you know that the first Thanksgiving in America actually didn't take place in 1621 at Plymouth Rock with the Pilgrims? Did you know also that at that 1621 meal, a Catholic saved the Pilgrims' lives? All that and more in this episode. Before we get into Squanto, the amazing Catholic Native American who helped save the pilgrims, I want to go back to the actual first Thanksgiving held on American soil. Not 1621, you have to go back more than a half century to St. Augustine, Florida. Well, they actually pronounce the the name of the city as St. Augustine. Catholics, of course, pronounce the name of the saint as St. Augustine. That's in Florida. It is actually the first permanently settled European colony on American soil. And it is the oldest settlement in the United States. It was founded in 1565 by Spanish Catholic explorers led by Pedro Menendez de Aviles on first sighting land on August 28th, which was the feast of St. Augustine. They named the city after him. On September 8th is when they first touched ground. September 8th is the feast of the nativity of Mary, the birthday of Our Lady. They held a great feast of Thanksgiving. They came ashore with great fanfare to the great astonishment of the the Native Americans because they'd never seen anything like this before. They held a mass of Thanksgiving, the holy sacrifice of the mass of Thanksgiving. Afterwards, they celebrated a communal feast with the local Siloy tribe. And it was the first communal Thanksgiving celebrated in the first permanently settled European colony on American soil. That is way back 1565. That was the first Thanksgiving in America. So Thanksgiving is thoroughly and originally Catholic. Even the National Park Service acknowledges the Catholic roots of the first Thanksgiving. I'm going to read a little bit from their website. What was the meal that followed? From our knowledge of what the Spaniards had on board their five ships, we can surmise that it was cocido, a stew made from salted pork and garbanzo beans, laced with garlic seasoning and accompanied by hard sea biscuits and red wine. If the siloy contributed to the meal from their own food stores, then the menu could have included turkey, venison, gopher, tortoise, mullet, drum, sea catfish, maize, meaning corn, beans, and squash. The website continues, this was the first community act of religion and thanksgiving in the first permanent European settlement in North America. It took place just 300 yards north of the Castillo de San Marcos, the castle, at what is now the mission of Nombre de Dios. This event is commemorated today by a 250-foot cross which stands on the original landing site. I've been to St. Augustine, the very beautiful little town, quaint little town worth going to, uh, but deep historic Catholic roots, the very first Thanksgiving. Now, other people, if you move over to the Southwest, Texas, you will have Texans say that there's another Thanksgiving celebrated in America. They call it Texas Thanksgiving Day, and that was in 1598, April 30th, 1598 to be exact, and that again was Catholic. What happened was the Spanish explorers, this time led by Don Juan de Oñate from Mexico, they were in Mexico from Spain, they traveled up to the American Southwest, to what is now known as New Mexico. They set up camp there, they held a mass of Thanksgiving, and they named the land New Mexico in honor of God and their Catholic king, Philip II. A large feast was held with the natives. Uh, The Franciscan priests blessed the food before everyone ate their fill, and at the end of the meal, the group put on a play, which was written by Captain Farfan, with scenes reenacting the conversion of the Native Americans to the Catholic faith upon first hearing it. I'm going to read from the Texas Almanac on this Catholic Thanksgiving about what happened before this time. By early March 1598, Nyonate's expedition of 500 people, including soldiers, colonists, wives, and children, and 7,000 head of livestock, was ready to cross the treacherous Chihuahuan Desert. Almost from the beginning of the 50-day march, nature challenged the Spaniards. First, seven consecutive days of rain made travel miserable. Then the hardship was reversed and the travelers suffered greatly from dry weather. 
On one occasion, a chance rain shower saved the parched colonists. Finally, for the last five days of the march before reaching the Rio Grande, the expedition ran out of both food and water, forcing the men, women, and children to seek roots and other scarce desert vegetation to eat. Both animals and humans almost went mad with thirst before the party in their hate uh, reached water. Two horses drank until their stomachs burst, and two others drowned in the river in their haste to consume as much water as possible. The Rio Grande was the salvation of the expedition. expedition. After recuperating it for 10 days, Oñate ordered a day of thanksgiving for the survival of the expedition. Included in the event was said was a feast supplied with game by the Spaniards and with fish by the natives of the region. A mass was said by the Franciscan missionaries traveling with the expedition. And finally, Oñate read La Toma, the taking, declaring the land drained by the great river to be the possession of King Philip II of Spain. And this is what one member of the expedition wrote, quote, We built a great bonfire and roasted the meat and fish and then all sat down to a repast the like of which we had never enjoyed before. We were happy that our trials were over, as happy as were the passengers in the ark when they saw the dove returning with the olive branch in his beak, bringing tidings that the deluge had subsided, close quote. Some historians call this one of the truly important dates in the history of the continent, marking the beginning of Spanish colonization in the American Southwest. So, yet another date marking Thanksgiving thoroughly Catholic, many, many years before the pilgrims ever arrived to Plymouth Rock. It's not too late to join our Ephesians Masterclass. Hundreds have already signed up, taking a deep dive into scripture and learning insights they never knew. You too can unlock the true meaning of the New Testament without having to spend months reading the Bible. The eight-week course is led by Chris Plants, who has a master's degree in theology and has taught hundreds of hours on the topic. Just go to churchmilton.com forward slash Ephesians dash masterclass. That's churchmilton.com forward slash Ephesians dash masterclass. But let's go ahead and turn to the pilgrims of Plymouth Rock. Who were the pilgrims? Well, they didn't call themselves pilgrims. They were known as Puritans, some of them Calvinists. Uh, very strict, uh, but, uh, and, and very anti-Catholic, by the way. But both Puritans and Catholics alike were persecuted by Queen Elizabeth I. So many myths, so many falsehoods circulating about Queen Elizabeth I. Catholics call her Bloody Bess. Now, Protestants call her Good Queen Bess, the Virgin Queen. There are films out there that laud her and praise her as some incredible monarch. And of course, Catholics who know her history, their history know her as a, uh, one of one of the most brutal uh, persecutors of Catholics in British history. In fact, she was known to use torture more than any other sovereign. And she tortured both Catholics and Puritans because the Catholics were too papist, too superstitious. There were too many popish trumperies, as they called. But the Puritans went in the opposite direction. They were too low church, um, just just too radical. Uh, and had gotten rid of absolutely every aspect of Catholicism. But the Anglicans thought of themselves as sort of the, the middle way, the via media, which held the right balance between Catholicism versus Puritanism. Bloody Bess didn't like either camp. She brutally persecuted both. I discussed some of her persecutions in a previous episode, um, and where I discussed the English martyrs, uh, St. Edmund Campion being among them. Um, it was the episode that says Going Underground. That was titled Going Underground. But under Bloody Bess, the mass was banned. In 1583, there was a law that imposed death for any Catholic hiding a fugitive priest. The priest would be put to death as well as the person hiding the priest. Um, these priests, you know, as I mentioned, St. Edmund Campion came from the continent to minister to the underground church. Catholics who were being persecuted, and so they would go in hiding in disguise from house to house to house that welcomed them, um, and there they would hide. They would offer the sacraments, minister to the faithful before they moved on to the next place. But like I said, in England at the time, under Bloody Bess, conversion of anyone from Protestantism to Catholicism was considered treason. And after 1585, any priest who was ordained abroad but was found on English soil 
was deemed a traitor immediately, immediately imprisoned. Anybody, like I said, who hosted him was considered a felon, punishable by death. Uh, receipt of superstitious items like rosary beads could uh, be punished and you could actually forfeit your land, your property, if they caught you having a rosary in your hand or any other Catholic sacramentals. And the only church service that you were allowed to attend was Anglican. If you refused to attend church services, you were fined. And those fines increased, um, you know, as the persecution increased. Now, there were some Catholics who protested in their own way. So just a few examples. A man named William Flamstead read his own book, his own Catholic book, during the Anglican sermons. Another fellow, Sir Richard Shireburn, put wool in his ears during the sermons. He did that for 20 years years when he was forced to attend Anglican services. Some refused to receive Protestant communion because, of course, it's just bread. It's not the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. And so uh, they would refuse to take it. They'd actually hide the bread in their sleeve and then at some point later take it out and throw it out because, again, just a piece of bread. Um, a woman named Kath Lucy actually took the bread and trod it underfoot. But recusants, the Catholic recusants, the ones who openly... Um, defied the strictures of the uh, the monarch, absolutely refused to attend any Anglican services. These were the ones who hid these fugitive priests. So like I said, the fines for not attending Anglican service, 1559, it was 12 pence. But in 1581, that increased to a crippling 20 pounds, which was a great deal of money Back then, it's not a whole lot of money today, but imagine 1559, uh, inflation, <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you take inflation into account, that was uh, a great deal of money for the average Catholic back then. If they couldn't pay that fine, then they had to, they would have to forfeit part of their estate. It was extremely oppressive. On February 25th, 1570, Pope Pius V excommunicated Queen Elizabeth I because, of course, she was baptized a Catholic. Uh, but because of her torture of Catholics and her brutal persecution or campaign against Catholics, he excommunicated her and he declared her an illegitimate pretender to the throne to whom Catholics owed no obeisance at all, no fealty. He said, you do not have to obey her. She's an illegitimate pretender to the throne. Of course, that ramped up the persecution for Catholics in, in uh, England because the queen was not happy about that. And like I said, she was considered one of the most brutal sovereigns in British history, resorted to torture more than any other sovereign. One of the worst deaths, uh, tortures and deaths she imposed on a Catholic was that of St. Margaret Clitheroe. This was a woman who converted from Protestantism to Catholicism. She hid a priest in her home and where the sacraments were offered. She was caught and she was imprisoned. And while she was in prison, she, there were many entreaties made for her to renounce her faith and that she would be let go and not tortured. And she refused. This is what she actually said when the sentence of death was announced on her. Quote, the sheriffs have said that I'm going to die this coming Friday, and I feel the weakness of my flesh, which is troubled at this news. But my spirit rejoices greatly. For the love of God, pray for me and all good people to do likewise. Her sentence of death consisted of being placed flat on her back on a sharp stone with a door laid on top of her and progressively heavier and heavier and heavier weights placed upon her, totaling 800 pounds until she was crushed to death. It was not an instantaneous death. It took 15 minutes for her to die. I cannot even imagine what that was like. I do not, I cannot even imagine what that was like. But she is now a saint in heaven after undergoing that. This actually happened on March 25th of 1586, which of course is the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th. Um, it was the day that we traditionally celebrate the conception of our Lord in the womb of Our Lady. A tremendous moment in all of human, humankind because this was now the heralding of the Savior of the world, March 25th. And for those of you who know this, that's the date. In that J.R.R. Tolkien, a devout Catholic, chose for the ring to be thrown uh, into the fires of 
Mount Doom. So a very significant date. This was the date that our Lord chose for St. Margaret Clithrow to undergo her suffering and enter into her glory. So St. Margaret Clithrow and all, all the English martyrs, martyrs of England and Wales, pray for us. But this was also the time of the priest holes. I've talked about this again in my previous episode titled Going Underground. Uh, this is where ingenious contraptions and hiding spaces were built um, all throughout various manses in England. For instance, Harvington Hall has multiple priest holes where priests would be taken in and they would be hidden in various places where it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the officials you know, of the government to find them. Uh, so many a priest hid in these ingenious priest holes. Many of these priest holes were built by Sir Nicholas Owen, a Jesuit brother who was eventually caught and tortured to death and never once under torture gave away the names of any of the priests or any of the individuals who um, housed any of these priests. As I mentioned in my previous episode, St. Edmund Campion was hanged, drawn, and quartered, one of the greatest scholars at the time um, in England. A total of 130 priests uh, executed under Bloody Bess, along with 60 lay supporters, tortured and executed. So returning to the pilgrims. It was under this campaign of brutal persecution of both Catholics and Puritans that a number of Puritans fled England and they took refuge in Holland. There they spent some time before they decided to come to the New World. So a group of them came, to, came from Holland. They met another group in Southampton and about 100 total boarded the Mayflower on September 16th of 1620. 65 days later, they would sight Cape Cod, eventually anchoring at Plymouth Rock. Thus was born the first colonial settlement in New England. But they were not the first to be there. It was actually Catholic Jesuit missionaries who had come some years before going up and down the coast of New England to evangelize and spread the faith. So again, Catholics were there first. The communal meal that we now know and celebrate as Thanksgiving took place in 1621 with about 90 Native Americans and, of course, the uh, pilgrims in that colony, and it lasted a total of three days. Now, we turn to the man who saved the pilgrims, an unlikely hero, Catholic, Squanto. We've all heard of Squanto. Uh, Squanto was, of course, the individual. How did he save them exactly? Well, he taught them how to plant corn, and he taught them how to fertilize the corn with fish. That first winter in the colony was extremely hard on the pilgrims. About half of them died through the very difficult winter, starvation, disease, various other things. And so when Squanto came to them the very next year, it was a godsend. It was like a miracle because half of them, like I said, had perished. And here was this man who came to show them how to survive. And because of his help, they did survive and they flourished. But what was his background? Because here they were absolutely astonished to see a Native American coming to them, speaking almost perfect English. How was that possible? Well, let's take a look at Squanto's background. He was, of course, there, born in America. He was captured by a man named Thomas Hunt. Thomas Hunt was the lieutenant of the famous Captain John Smith. Probably heard of that name. Captain John Smith fell in love with Pocahontas. Anyway, his lieutenant, Thomas Hunt, captured Squanto along with a number of, of other natives and kept them as slaves on his ship. And they sailed back to Spain, hoping to sell them as slaves. At that time, uh, approximately two to five million Native Americans were captured and sold as slaves during the colonial era. So for six weeks on this ship, Squanto was shackled in chains in the darkness and the filth of the ship's hold. Rocking in the waves, battered by the storms, he endured hunger, thirst, vomited from seasickness. He was violently ill the entire time. And he was forced to leave everything that he once knew for who knows what future. Of course, slavery. That's what he was looking forward to. And um, I can't even imagine what that must have been like for him. If you just put yourself in the shoes of someone who's just been captured and now you're being held in this what seems like a dungeon in chains, sitting in your own vomit and filth, leaving everything behind that you knew going towards this unknown and very dark future. Um, and it was then that he really started to think about God. It's then that he started to 
realize there, there's a higher power here. and He's in control. And once they landed in Spain on Malaga, his captor tried to sell him in the open market. I hope you're enjoying the show. The rest of the show is behind the paywall. So please go to churchmilton.com to watch the rest. For those who are not premium subscribers, you can sign up at churchbuilding.com forward slash go premium. See you there.